Hi everyone, welcome to HubShot's episode 271. And this episode is the lazy person's cheat sheet to using HubSpot. Plus we talk, are webinars dead? When to use HubSpot surveys instead of forms? And Google Ads performance max campaigns. You're listening to Asia Pacific's number one HubSpot focused podcast where we discuss HubSpot tips, tricks and strategies for growing your sales, service marketing and operations results. My name is Ian Jacob from Search and Be Found and with me is Craig Bailey from Zen Systems. How are you, Craig? I'm really well. Back into it now. February. Wow, January went quickly. Already into February. Hey, before we start, I just wanted to mention something. I didn't have this in the show notes. I'm just going to spring this on, on you, <laughs> Ian. I had a, a, a really nice comment uh, my wife was telling me about yesterday about giving compliments to people. Yes. So you can make people's day just by giving them a compliment about something specific they're doing. So in her case, it was something to do with a, a particular um, place that she'd visited and had had really good service. And this place, you know, they're just inundated with things and, you know, everyone's under stress at the moment with COVID and all that. Just took a moment to highlight a very specific thing they did and thank them for it. And this, it made this person's day because especially on customer service, people are just getting hammered with rude, frustrated people. So, look, I just thought I'd put that at the top of the show. Uh, just be kind, people. All right, on with the show. All right. Our webinar's dead, Craig. That is our growth thought of the week. Yeah. You know, I wanted to discuss this topic because a lot of our clients are still pushing hard on webinars. I don't think they're particularly effective. That's not the tr true in all cases for some clients. It is. But we've got clients that have come and say, we want to do webinars, we want to push them. We're like, I don't know why, but okay, give it a go. We're, I'm not a, really a supporter of it. And I was like, why do people even attend webinars? And so in the show notes, I've put out my whole argument why I think webinars are dead, or at least they should be. I realize I'm wrong. Um, there are still webinars are alive and well, it seems. But here's why I think they're bad or, or inefficient, shall we say. I think because they're in real time, you can't speed them up. Two, there's often technical difficulties. I mean, how many, you know, to get on, they go, oh, can you hear me? Oh, is my screen, can you see my screen? Oh, a bit bigger, do you want that a bit, oh, okay. You know, that kind of malarkey. Then there's also the fact that there's so much guff in between. Uh, and I'll tell you what I'm comparing this to in a second. And then there's the other thing. Y y I used to attend, I haven't attended for years, I have to say, so maybe this has changed, but you attend and like, oh, look, we'll just wait another couple of minutes for more people to attend. It's like, oh man, it's 10 past, <laughs> you know. It's just such a waste of time. And besides the fact I can't zoom through them at one and a half or two times speed, I just don't understand why anyone attends them. Now, I will register for them, so but I'll never attend them. So at least I can get the summary afterwards and and a recording and skim through them but i think by far the much more efficient method these days is youtube and i know we talk about this all the time i watch so much stuff on youtube it's so better produced in many wa cases they edit out all that stuff you know it's kind of like this podcast um chris uh Mottram, who edits and produces our podcast by the way shout out to chris at podcastly does an excellent job he'll take 30 minutes of us talking and bring it down to 24 minutes, right? That's six minutes less. That's about 20%. That's saved you 20% of guff. You don't get that on a webinar. You have to sit through all of that guff, right? Plus, of course, YouTube, you can speed it up. And the production, even things like audio quality is so much better. But things like zooming in on screen, they're sharing their screen. Zoom in, they'll see it. It's just a much better experience you can learn. I should say I have a YouTube premium subscription. I never see ads. I couldn't handle it if there were ads. But I just don't understand why people are still pushing webinars instead of a properly produced YouTube video. A lot of the people will get their webinar and put it on YouTube. And of course, no one watches it there because there's much better stuff on YouTube to watch. Why aren't they putting the time and money into YouTube? So that's my thinking. But I know you do attend them. And so I was interested in your thoughts and listeners, well, interested in listeners' thoughts as, as well. What am I missing here? So let me just start by saying I don't actually attend any um, lead generation webinars. Let's put it that way, right? So people I don't know. The part where I do attend, Craig, is I've been a part of a mastermind that um, where we learn a lot about Google ads, Facebook ads, marketing, and they have a monthly webinar where they get people on. 
and you learn something. So there's a, often there's a learning component and then there's a, you can ask questions of the presenter. So it, it's a pretty closed community. So they know the people that are there, they've interacted on the forum, et cetera. So those are ones that I probably only attend and there's one or two live ones that I've attended where we might find it interesting. Now, one thing I did notice, like we were on the HubSpot partner update the other week and they've done that in two time zones. And it was really, what was interesting, there was some pre-recorded components, there were some live components, but I, I did notice that they, they did a, they made everything pretty concise. There was not a lot of guff happening. It was very, you knew exactly, you know, this person's talking for five minutes, goes from 1020 to 1025. And they were very structured with their time. So that was really good. Now, why do I want to sit on them? I, I want to have a set time. So if I know that at that time, I, it's kind of like a forced learning I have. So I'm like, I'll get up and I'll do that. Um, there's some sort of interactivity in that webinar. So they're, they're actually asking questions. They're giving the opportunity to get feedback. And of course, if it's the only time I don't attend is if it's a recorded and an ungodly hour of the morning, like say at three o'clock in the morning, or it was a really interesting topic that I wanted to do. So that's the only time I would do that. But you're right. I, it can be annoying. And I actually not too long ago, I think I jumped on one where they had a lot of guff at the start. And I was like, when, when are we going to get to the meat of this? I, I don't want to hear about how everyone's feeling. And that was a really key thing. So I think that's very important. But I think like it's, it can, it's kind of like chalk and cheese. So, hmm. yeah. Actually, there's some good points there. So can I just check with those more private community ones, are they actually a webinar or are they more like just a, clo a small closed group Zoom meeting? Is it, it is, it, funnily kind of? enough, it is run, yes. So the, it, it, it is probably more like a closed Zoom meeting versus a webinar. But it kind of, if you'd like to say in the real sense, I, I don't know who else is on there, but there is an opportunity. Like they'll say, oh, okay, Craig, do you want to ask a question? You know, or oh, Craig's right. got a question and then they'll, they'll let you talk and ask the question. Mm. Yeah. So actually, I think that's a really good point. And yeah, you've, you've probably changed my mind on that part. Um, as opposed to the big group kind of just anonymous observer that's uh, right thing which i think yeah exactly okay, good points all right on to our quick shots of the week and here are a few uh items that will be of interest to you you can now partition hub db tables which is interesting because uh you still can't partition social accounts uh we have marketing event data so webinars zooms go to webinar and you can use that in filtering lists What's the next one, Craig? Oh, just, uh, it looks like they're finally giving Shopify a bit of love, Ian. So you can put Shopify items or products, I should say, as line items in deals and quotes. Which is actually really good because that's something that we've been waiting for for a long time. Mm. And the next one is report builder updates. And this is in public beta. So smart chart options and scatter plot visu visualization. Yeah, we'll be chatting about those too in a future episode, actually. It, it, you, you know how we've said last last couple of episodes, it's all about report builder. Reporting is like the big focus. Yeah, this is Correct. it's getting so much better. Yeah. And then finally is... Yeah, there's um, copy section Hubble. So in page editor, if you're in developer mode, I've got a link to that in the show notes. So you can actually be editing a page and hover over a section and copy a section as Hubble. Uh, so if uh, you've got no idea why or what that means, then it probably isn't for you. But as a developer, this uh, gives you a little bit more efficiency when copying code uh, in between uh, templates. All right. And that's for all the developers out there. On to our HubSpot marketing feature of the week. And then we're talking about translated forms. And this follows on from our episode in 248, where we talked about translated forms. And you're probably likely aware that you can easily translate for versions of pages. But here you might want to translate the actual form to be collected in a different language. Let me preface this by saying, I don't think people realize just how good HubSpot CMS is for multi-language websites. There is actually a fair bit of stuff just out of the box that you can do. And creating translated pages, as you said, is very easy. You just do it from the actions menu. And if you actually want a form that's translated to use on those pages, then you just translate forms as well. 
as you said, we had did cover this a little while ago. I thought it was worth revisiting. We're actually doing a big project with a client at the moment. There's all those translations and forms is one of them. Because there's nothing worse than having your main site and then, oh, here's the French version, but oh, the form is still in English. It's kind of jarring. So it's very easy. And out of the box, HubSpot includes translated labels. I, I think it's within 28 languages. Might be more by the time you're listening to this. For, m for all their standard properties on contacts and deals and companies. So what that means is if you've got a pretty standard form, uh, name, email, a few standard uh, properties, address, that kind of thing, phone number, you can actually go create translation, choose the language, create translation of the form, choose the language and all the labels just magically turn to that other language, save the form, and then in terms of using it, you can either manually insert it just in that translated page or you can use things such as smart forms uh, or even just smart content if it's in a rich text block and s for some reason you're um, inserting a form that way. So that's very flexible, it's very powerful and I think it's one of those under, I'll say underappreciated or under and not well known benefits of HubSpot CMS. All right. And on to our HubSpot sales feature of the week. And this is the lazy person's cheat sheet to using HubSpot. Now, listeners, this will be available as a separate download, but also we, we will be creating a page on it on the site. So it will be available there. But this really came out of a session we had with one of our customers. And they said, hey, have you got one of these cheat sheets, like the lazy person's cheat sheet to HubSpot? And I said, Oh, I don't, but I can come up with one. And so that's what Craig and myself have done to really help if you're in sales or in a sales role, really utilize the system. Now, in saying that, regardless, I think whoever's using HubSpot, you could use this cheat sheet to gain a lot of efficiency. So we're just going to go through it one by one and it will be available as a download. So let us know. Y y you know what? I just want to highlight because uh, to listen, Ian did uh, most of this. I'll put it all in the show notes. There is gold here. So many quick tips. And you know what, Ian? Th just the content we're going to go through in the next couple of minutes, some companies would run entire webinars, <laughs> lead gen <laughs> webinars, talking about how in the next hour we're going to take you through our top power tips. So anyway, folks, you're getting it for a couple of minutes, uh, all compressed and efficiently delivered to you here. Uh, but yeah, check it out. Ian's put show notes and everything. Let's, uh, yeah, let's dive through them. All right, so the first one, which is a massive time saver and helps you stop chasing people to choose the time to meet with you, is using meetings within HubSpot. So having that set up and giving people an option and, there, and also be aware this is not just one option. You can create separate meeting invites for different parts of your sales process, your marketing processes, your operations processes and use this as a tool to easily enable that meeting with people. Uh, be it via phone, online, or even in person. So example, one of the meetings I set up for one of my customers was they wanted to have coffee catch-ups with people because they're in the construction industry. So I created a meeting and I said, stop chasing people. Put this link and say, choose a time that suits you and let's meet at this coffee shop. Massive difference to the way they operate on a daily basis. It's so good. And if you're using meetings, then you're like, yeah, of course, this is so obvious. If you're not, which is most of the clients we work with, they're, they're like, oh, meetings. No, I didn't know about it. Oh, just use it. It's so good, so efficient. The second one is tasks. Setting the right type of task here so you can efficiently work through tasks is really the key. And you know what? It just seems like a really odd thing to bring to the surface, but this can save you a massive amount of time. And this coupled along with queuing can save you even more time. And what this means is you're either choosing that if this is a to-do task, it's a call, it's an email, maybe you need to send a LinkedIn sales navigator email, or you need to actually do a LinkedIn sales navigator connection. If you choose the right type, it'll save you a lot of time from having to take extra clicks and do certain things. The next one is inbox connection to track and log of emails. And this is across Office 365 and Google Mail. And one of the key things I see that an is not turned on is that people don't actually have it set up correctly. So they're not either uh, tracking things correctly or they are not using the inbox automation feature where 
this will automatically capture contact details and update contact records in CRM and even follow up task suggestions based on what it sees. So this gives the system the ability to run through your inbox and kind of get this data so you don't have to spend time putting that data in. Massive time saver. All right, the next one, which again is a very often hidden and people are so unaware of it, is the lead customer revisit notifications. And this is really if you want to know customers are coming back to the website or even prospects are coming to your site that you are interested in talking to. And this has been a massive change for people because they can, you can A, do contacts you own and contacts you view and you can get real-time alerts in your activity feed and even an email. And so very interesting, especially where people are doing, say, for example, we've got customers that do tenders, right? They do a tender, they do they submit a tender, and then because they've got the prospect or the website visit notification on, they see organizations that have requested the tender on their website checking things out. And that is such a good indicator to see how well things are performing and how engaged people are when they're engaging with your business. Next one, task queues. This, coupled with the previous one we talked about tasks, is an efficient way to manage your workflow and never forget to follow up contacts. I'll give you an example of two different types of task queues. One I have is a follow-up task queue, so anything to do with follow-ups. I also have an email and a call task queue. Now you kind of go, well, why would I want to do that? I've already said I want to have an email in the previous um, uh, type of uh, task, right? What this does is bunch all of the calls, all of the emails together, and you basically sequentially work through it. And you also see that it looks like there's a little, uh, there looks like an icon where it has multiple people, means that I've shared that task with somebody. Works especially well when you work in teams and you're like, okay, well, we've got a lot of stuff here and we need to follow people up, especially initial inquiries. You might not necessarily rotate to a single salesperson or a single person in your team. You might say, because the, we have team changing over the day. Let's put it in the shared queue and let's at the start of the session, let's go through that queue. We can assign 10 to, 10 to Craig, 10 to Ian, and let's work through it. Whatever doesn't get done can remain in the queue for the person coming in later on in the day to actually action. So it's a great way to share the task queues, but sequentially work through things. We know we talk about context switching often and this helps you not do that context switching but stay focused on getting things done. Next, underutilized feature, documents. Having this in one place will save you from attaching it to emails plus you can see who viewed your page and what pages they viewed and how long they looked at those pages. Really great if you've got prospectus documents, you've got brochures that you're sending out to people. Keeps it at a single source, all the sales team can use it if you need to update, you can update the document without having to have everybody replace it on their drives. And you get intelligence. So you can say, okay, well, this month we've got a 10 page um, uh, price list, for example. Actually, no one's reading the prices for this uh, on page five. Why have we got it in page five and what's causing people not to read or skim over it? Gets you asking the next level of questions as to how effective, should we cut this document down? Should we take page five and stick it at the end and bring the pages that people are spending on towards the front? Really important and really valuable. The next thing is snippets. Do less typing and use it everywhere from your emails, notes to meetings. This is massive. This is a massive change and has improved over time. But think of it as little bits of text that you can utilize in your day-to-day -day working around HubSpot. And you can pull data out of HubSpot. So for example, a snippet that I often talk about is you've got a task that you often send, say, accounts. You need to put information that they need to create, say, an account in another system. So you need to collect like a business number, com the official company name, maybe who the responsible person is. And you've got all that data in HubSpot. You can, with a snippet, you can pull up that snippet, put it in a, in a task, and send it to and assign it to that person without you having to go and find that data within HubSpot. And the simplest way to use this is you can start typing by a hash and two characters and you will, it'll show you all the relevant snippets that meet, that uh, have that name. Massive time saver. We use it for terms and conditions. 
we use it for creating links to certain things so we don't have to keep typing it out every single time. The next one is an extension of of what we we're talking about snippets is templates. So these are entire templates that you can utilize in your email to help people not have to think about what to write and that can be utilized in bulk across the system. And you can share with people, you can share with team and you're all talking a consistent message. The other thing you can do in there is you can embed video in there or a link to a video which you'll see in the example that I've done with a meeting link. So again here we're pulling valuable information from CRM into our template saving us massive amounts of time and keeping the communication personal. And it can be used from within HubSpot or within your email client either Gmail or Outlook 365. Now once you've got templates sorted out the next thing we're talking about is sequences which are sales uh, automation and this builds on templates and this is about having either emails or to-do tasks in there in a in a sequence of events that you edit at the start and then you basically set in motion. The only way people get out of this is if they reply to an email or you could opt them out if you have sales enterprise in a workflow because they've taken a certain action. We spoke about this in the last episode, episode 270, about how to do that. And what this does is have you not worry about constantly thinking, well, what's the next thing I need to send? Or what is the next thing I need to do with this contact in a one-to-one -one perspective? An example of this being utilized in businesses is they do follow-ups with quotes. So they've sent the quote and then they put people in a quote follow-up sequence. So it could involve an email, maybe it's a, a to-do which is a call a couple of days later, maybe if they don't get through another email. So it's a really fantastic and simple way to use it. And actually to be honest, this is used on one of the businesses we work with, not in their sales team, in their customer team that looks after clients and they're using sequences every day. All right, the next thing I'm going to talk about is the mobile app for calling out of HubSpot and it getting logged automatically inside HubSpot. Now this happens on the contact view or even on your mobile but gives you the ability to quickly take notes, create follow-up tasks and not have to log an event because it's already happening. And the key there is to utilize it and utilize it often. And again, if you've got a task that says you've got a call, you can just go through that task and it'll pop, automatically pop up the call window without you having to do three clicks to get there. So this will be a massive amount of time saved when doing your calling. The next one is to do with reporting and I've seen sales individuals waste two plus hours every week putting together weekly reports for their management team or their direct reports on how they are doing. Did you know you can automate this and get back two hours of your life? And also as a bonus you can automate the delivery every day, week or month to the people that you need and you can uh, even um, give a particular piece of data without you getting involved and it's a fantastic way to automate, set and forget your reporting and keeps everybody happy that things are happening. And finally, something new and this is to do with meetings. In HubSpot you can now propose times to people using the meetings functionality tool. So you can choose multiple times and then the person can click that and book themselves in at a time that you have given them access to that's available in your calendar and works super well and you'll see screenshots of that in the show notes. And there we have it, the lazy person's guide to using HubSpot. Wow. So in just a couple of minutes, Ian, you've gone through so many items there. Listeners, if your head's kind of like, oh man, that was too many things to follow, I totally understand. Go to hubshots.com slash subscribe, sign up for the show notes, you get it all there. Ian's put nice screenshots and animated images and things guiding you through. 
and uh, it'll and it'll also be available on hubshots.com. You can see all our uh, episodes there. Ian will be preparing this actually as a download as well. By the way, I should mention, you know, if <laughs> we've just prepared all this and it's out to listeners right here, you know, no calls to action, no sign-ups or anything that, you know, take you down um, dark patterns or anything like that. Unlike a lot of people who just, you know, oh, we've got to get the whole campaign ready before we make it available. It's all there, folks, just in the show notes. Check it out. Um, go through them because there's a lot there. If you just pick out one or two, to implement in the next week, your efficiency will increase. All right, on to HubSpot service feature of the week, Craig. When well, should I you use a survey instead of a form? Yeah, I thought this was uh, an interesting comparison to make because a lot of people, and we've done this for years, we actually haven't d used surveys in HubSpot or other tools. We just create a form, put it on a page, send an email out, hey, fill out the survey. And there's been some benefits of that. Uh, in particular, you can have the form pre-filled with their details, especially if they're sent there from an email. And second, you can have progressive form fields so they don't get to fill out stuff if they've already filled it in. And then you can also have conditional fields, uh, which in surveys you can't. So you might think, oh, okay, so what's the benefit of surveys then? Well, there's tons of benefits. So some of them are, well, first of all, it's very quick and easy to set up and send a survey. Yeah, you don't have to worry about creating a page, embedding and all that kind of stuff. It's like bang, does it for you. But also, and here's where it gets more interesting, it's the presentation of the survey. So you can have a range of questions. You can have those uh, sections that have emojis and stars and images. You can actually have sections in the survey. You can break it up, put headings, you can put rich text, all that kind of stuff, which you can't in forms. And then the other thing about surveys, which theoretically you can do for forms if you've created custom reports and all that kind of stuff, is the reporting on responses of surveys is very clean. It's just there. Go to the, uh, you know, the analysis tab and you can see the survey responses and what came in. So there's a quick comparison of why you'd want to choose a survey instead of a form. Fantastic. And now, listeners, let us know if you are using it like we have discussed, because I'm curious, um, because we were discussing this and we just decided to try a different way to do something because we were going to send automate a marketing email that was being sent out to people that had taken certain ac actions on the website that we knew of. And we're then trying to gauge some feedback and previously we did it in a form because we didn't have service professional. But the fact that we had this, we thought, oh, let's try and create a quick survey to see whether we can fulfill or get the same data. And that was what was interesting in this whole process. All right, HubSpot CMS Feature of the Week, Craig. Save sections. All right, so we touched on this back in episode 262. Thought I'd expand on it here because it can be confusing. So saved sections is a newish feature of pages and emails. You've probably seen it in emails because when you save a section in an email, it nicely appears down the left-hand sidebar. But you might not be as familiar with saved sections in pages. And you get them from section controls. Uh, when you're hovering over a section, you can actually just drop down in section controls and save a section. But they don't really appear anywhere, so you might get confused. But before I go into that, I'll just explain when you hover over a section in a page, this is using the drag and drop builder. If you've got a theme, it's you know, drag and drop. Hovering over a section, there's three kinds of controls. On the left-hand side, you've got the section controls. That's where you can edit, clone, or delete the section. Over on the right-hand side, you've got module controls. So modules appear within a section. And this can be confusing because people are like, oh, am I cloning a module or am I cloning the section? especially if there's only one module in a section. And then in the middle, you've got column controls. And depending how your theme's set up, you, you see column controls or you might have an add section button. Why am I mentioning all this? And there is a nice little image in the show notes. It's because people get confused. They're like, well, how do I save a section and how do I use it again? So the summary is section controls. That's when you hover over on the left-hand side in a page. Uh, you can save a section, but you don't actually see the available sections till you add a new section. And that's normally, normally that blue plus button in the middle of a section. You can click the blue plus and then you can add a new section and that's where you'll see your list of saved sections. I think you can have up to 25 
save section. So little feature there. I'd love to know how many people use it. I suspect most people don't even know it exists. But there you go. Quick tip for HubSpot CMS. Perfect. And now onto our HubSpot workflow action of the week. Managing email subscription status action. All right. So you can manage a contact's email subscription type uh, in a number of ways. You can do it individually at the contact level. You can do it in bulk, actually in contact view. You can select a whole bunch of contacts and then go, you know, edit and set. Or you can do it via a workflow, which is why we've put it in this section. And it's sitting down there in the property management set of actions. You can manage email subscription status. You can select opt-in or opt-out, by the way. And when uh, you've got business units, you'll actually have different preference groups that you can control those subscription types in. But here's a few examples. You might like, like, well, why would I even use this? Common use cases are if you've imported from another system, either um, manually or maybe they've come in via uh, another tool or manual import. Um, let's say it's another ticketing system. You know, support tickets is in something else that comes in. So when that comes in, you want to trigger a workflow and maybe because you know in that external system they had subscribed to something, then you subscribe them in the workflow. So you just take care of that. It's almost like a syncing process. And this is the thing. If you're using Operations Hub to data sync, you can often just take care of that with the Operations Hub um, actions. But in case you don't or are not doing it via Operations Hub or it's a tool that's not currently integrated, this is the way to do it. Uh, within workflow action. So a little uh, um, tip there, I guess this is down in the weeds of uh, synchronizing systems together, but very powerful and useful one to have. All right, and here we have next our bookmarked items of the week and some interesting items we've found, but we haven't necessarily used as yet. Uh, first one being pinch payments, and this is about integrating your payments with Zero and HubSpot together. And I have... Uh, integrated this with HubSpot for a customer of ours that uses Xero and Pinch Payments along with another system to take pre-approval of payments before they, they're a pool company, they visit people so they take pre-approvals before they visit someone to do work. Mm. So that's been my experience of it. It's actually been a nice integration with HubSpot and the ability to see all that data in the contact record. And the next one that we stumbled upon was HubClock, which is timesheets within HubSpot. And it's I think nicely, nicely integrated. Uh, the de the developers done a nice job on that. I haven't used it yet, but uh, I think a lot of people would actually use this. Correct. And I think it, it does it show it shows how long people are using the tools, right, within HubSpot. Yeah, well, you you basically once you've got it integrated, uh, I'm basing this on the site. Haven't used it myself, but you have an option on a contact. You can just start logging time. Yep. And and then it gets allocated to that time. Appears in their t activity. And you can actually run reports to then actually uh, summarize. So there you go. You can use the custom report builder because that time is actually logged as a custom object uh, event. So yeah, it's very. It looks really cool. Actually, I think that's got a lot of potential. That's right. And it's a fellow Aussie, right? He's up in Queensland. Yeah, that's right. We should reach out and say hello. So we should. All right, onto our tool of the week, Craig, and then uh, it's called Flat Icon, and we mentioned this a year ago, but worth another reminder, there are six million plus icons for free without attribution from a flat icon. And um, yeah, there just is a really handy icon set. I've, we, we've actually used this in um, some sites and landing pages. We've got a screenshot of some examples there. Yeah, really handy. Very nicely done. All right, now listeners, onto our sunset of the week. Go on, Craig. Hit me up. Well, you know, back <laughs> in episode 257, we talked about why HubSpot CRM starter was so good. Yes. And one of the things we highlighted was their pricing for contacts. Yes. Because it was almost at the enterprise pricing level, really Correct. expensive. Uh, well, that gift horse has bolted, I'm afraid. And they've, I don't know if it was a, 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 a an error they made or whether it was just for during COVID or something like that, special deal. But no, the price is now back up to the pro costing so unfortunately you've missed that out i'd love to know what they're going to do when people renew if they sign up on the old pricing be interesting to see but anyway that's gone it was good while it lasted <laughs> it certainly was and regardless starter marketing is still a great place to start crm suite starter
All right, on to our quote of the week, Craig. You know, we normally do an uh, aspirational quote um, from someone out there. Well, I said, let's do a quote of someone talking about us. <laughs> so this is actually a <laughs> testimonial, and you kindly oblige. So uh, what's this quote that you found? Uh, and this is from Stephanie Russell from Remotish, and it, I just happened to find, I was doing a search to find out where we were mentioned, funnily enough, because we're trying to improve our marketing, Craig. So, And it, I found this one from uh, Stephanie Russell. It was an interview she did, and she joined a Remotish, and she said, there is one HubSpot podcast that I've been listening to, and it's called HubShots. It's these two guys from Australia. Here we are, the two turkeys, and they tell you everything HubSpot. Like they'll give you new tips. For me, being a beginner to HubSpot, it's really nice to get an outside perspective from professionals without it being super work related. They make it super casual and fun, but it's really interesting because I'm still learning about wor working with it. So thank you, Stephanie, for A, connecting with us and B, saying such kind words. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Made my day when I saw that, when Ian pointed that out to me. Thank you. All right, on to our training of the week, and we discussed Google Ads Performance Max campaigns, and this training is from Benjamin Mangold from Loves Data, who we love a lot. He's actually, he's trained both of us in Google Ads certification over the years, which we've uh, taken and still continue to take, but he walks you on the setup of a Performance Max campaign in Google Ads. So, you know, his company is called Loves Data. Yes. I reckon we should have a, 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 a shot called Loves Benjamin. That's right. We, we love this guy. He's so good. <laughs> so, Benjamin, if you're listening, thank you for all that you do and have taught us over the years. And listeners, this Google Ads Performance Max campaigns, we've just started running it with clients. And it's interesting, the results, because of the, the way Google are trying to do things now, well worth having a look, especially if you're running shopping ads. Very interesting to see how it performs because kind of brings everything together within the campaign from shopping to display to search and puts it all in the one place and I guess you're it's using a broader lot of assets and looking at it holistically not just doing one thing at a time and that's why they call it the performance max campaign you know I want to uh, say I I, I think I, it's about 14 minutes I think this video it's so worth it we've been sending it to clients as well um, because he explains it so well. I, uh, you know what? This is the content that he covers. He's got nice screenshot. Uh, well, it's a video. Nice um, coverage and walks you through it. Uh, nicely edited. Another reason why I go to YouTube rather than webinar. I'm, I'm pretty sure some people would turn what Benjamin's done nice and beautifully in 14 minutes into an hour-long webinar where they waste your time and you can't see the screen. You know, Another reason to use YouTube. Sorry, just harking on that. But... Go and look at this. The reason we sent it to clients is like, here's how easy Benjamin makes it. He just breaks it down. And the reason we like to do that is because I'm sure um, they often get a agencies bamboozling them with, you know, oh, we're going to do this in Google Ads and this is great and it's M uh, ML and uh, AI stuff and all that's really complex and all of this. And it's like, no, no, go and look at this video. He breaks it down. Now, we're going to implement it for you. This is what we tell clients. But here's how simple it is and why are we going to manage this for you. A lot of, and we've said this before on the show, Ian, a lot of the value that companies like you and us uh, offer is getting campaigns pointed in the right direction. Uh, the days of us every day managing them and checking that are kind of going away a year or two. Google will just take care of that with their artificial intelligence, machine learning and that, but pointing them in the, in the right direction. That's the benefit or the value we add at the moment. And all of this stuff, these Performance Max campaigns, they're an example of Google taking over all that heavy lifting work. And, well, great. It means we can focus on spending our time doing other things of high value for clients. So check out this video if you want to know just how um, simple and effective they are to set up. Well, listeners, this is the end of our show. If you haven't subscribed to our show notes, which get delivered every Friday, please do so at hubshots.com. And if you are interested in HubSpot coaching, we have that available and you can join the wait list for HubSpot coaching but with Craig and myself. It's action-packed oriented. And also, finally, I'd like to finish the episode to say thank you for listening. Thank you for being with us over the years. I think we're coming up to seven years now, Craig. <laughs> 
Wow. And uh, and we do appreciate it. We do appreciate all the connections we've made, all the conversations we have. And it really does enrich our lives on a day-to-day basis. And we are forever grateful and thankful. Well, until next time, Craig. Catch you later, Ian.